Hello, my name is Colin Doyle. I am a senior consulting engineer at Juniper Networks and welcome to the fifth video that I thought I already recorded, but it turns out I forgot the audio uh, in my updated Appster and EVNG lab series. In the last video, which is not the one I just recorded, this was exactly the same thing we're about to do now, uh, but the actual last video you're watching, we deployed our fabric. In this video, we are going to build the uh, tenant that we're going to be putting our subnets into that our hosts connect to. Uh, we're not doing multi-tenancy within the scope of this series, but we will have to touch on it when we get into the next part of this series, which is separate, where we do firewall service chaining. I decided not to fix the, well, I'm sorry, not to reset the lab, I should say, for this video without showing you how I'm doing it. Right now, I've got all green. I actually have deployed my routing zones and virtual networks. Uh, like I said, there was no audio. Whoops. <laughs> so I need to undo all that, which since I only did one commit is fairly straightforward. I'm going to go to Time Voyager here. I didn't make a note. <laughs> I, I don't really need to because I can kind of keep track of this in my head, but I can just click this button right here to jump to that revision. And I can do this in both of the data centers, go to Time Voyager and just jump back a version. And we'll go back to A here. And if I go to uncommitted, you'll see all the work that I did in the last, well, you won't know because I <laughs> you didn't get to watch the video, I had no audio, but I can, I can see. This is all the work that we're going to be doing in this video in a moment, getting undone. So I'm going to go ahead and commit this here in both of these data centers. And then I'm going to take you through all the cool steps to get right back to that point Except this time, you'll be able to hear me. How fun. Okay. All right. All green, good to go. So we have to start by creating a routing zone. A routing zone is essentially a VRF. Start in staged, go to virtual, go to routing zones. The default routing zone is the default routing instance on the switch. This is where the underlay lives. It's always there. We cannot change it because the underlay always has to exist. I'm going to click create routing zone. We're going to have just one, like I mentioned, it's going to be called tenant one. So tenant one, VLAN ID 10, VNI 110. No routing policies, we'll just use the default and we're going to configure symmetric IRB. This wasn't something we always supported. We used to do asymmetric IRB. A lot of vendors do symmetric IRB, including vendors that Appster supports under the multi-vendor model. I don't know a reason, and I asked architects about this and DEs, why you would not just use symmetric if it's available. Uh, maybe you have a reason, I don't know. I'm expecting this to be the default one day. It's certainly what we're going to use here. So we'll create this in DCA. We'll jump over to DCB and we'll do the same. Virtual routing zones, create routing zone, tenant one, VLAN ID 10, VLAN network identifier, uh, pardon me, VXLAN network identifier 110, symmetric, create. Terrific. Next, we are going to create virtual networks. Go back to DCA. Virtual networks are subnets. Every subnet or virtual network needs to be assigned to a routing zone. A routing zone can have multiple subnets in it, multiple virtual networks. Our DCA has two, so does DCB, but they're different. Uh, both DCs have virtual network 101. That 101, 102, and 103 stand for the third, they represent the third octet in uh, the subnets we're gonna be assigning out of the class C space. Uh, we have 101 and 102 in DCA and 101 and 103 in DCB. Now we'll start with VN 101, routing zone tenant one, VNI is 10101, VLAN ID is 101. We reserve that across the blueprint. You can do a lot of tricky stuff with VXLAN and VLANs, uh, basically changing the VLAN ID, uh, using the same VNI on either end. We're not doing any of that. The reserving just means we're not going to step on our own feet by accidentally assigning that elsewhere. Meaningless in our lab as small as ours, but if you're running at scale, uh, it's a pretty good box to check unless you plan to do some witchcraft. Uh, 192.168.101.0 slash 24 and 192.168.101.1. .1. We're going to create a connectivity template automatically. You don't have to check this. It just saves a step. It's going to be untagged for the moment. 
this will get switched to tagged, not through this workflow, but later on we'll have a DCI and we'll need to convert this to a tagged interface that it's assigned to so that we can also do our WAN connectivity over the same link. For now, untagged. And we're gonna associate that with the server rack because that is the switch that the host plugs into. Our lab's small, so it makes it's kind of hard to understand why this matters, but if you've got a big data center, you don't want to define every VN that you have on every single switch unless that VN exists on every single switch. Usually you're going to know what VNs connect to which switches, and you're just going to assign that configuration there and help reduce the amount of uh, retransmission uh, packet. You know, the network has to do something with bum traffic. You don't want to be forwarding traffic to switches where hosts aren't connected. They can actually do anything with it. All right, so we got VN 101, create another, and let's do VN 102, routing zone tenant one, VNI is 10102, 102, reserve, 192, 162.102.0 slash 24, 162.102.0. That is untagged, and I just got a message. And can I start warming some pot? Oh yeah, my wife is asking me to warm up some lunch. Just a moment, dear. Uh, and we'll assign that to that server rack. Create. You'll note that we now have, wait, what? What did I do wrong? You tell me. Uh, 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 uh. Oh, that, <laughs> turns out that, that needs to not be a network ID. Okay, yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Okay, we're leaving it in. There we are. You'll note that we have red here. Now that we're starting to create subnets in this routing instance, we need to have a loopback interface assigned to it. And that's just a matter of finding the DCA loopback uh, pool and assigning it, and that'll clear that out. And we'll do the same in DCB, perfect. And I am moving so quickly, I'm not going to pause to go start warming up my wife's lunch because I'm pretty sure I can get through this quickly. Uh, let's see, so we had VN 101 here. And 10101, 101, reserved. This is a separate blueprint, and you have to check that for every blueprint. 198.168.101.0 slash 24. So DCA and DCB represent discrete separate fabrics. So it's well, that's locally relevant to the fabric. If you're wondering why, like, wait, didn't you just check that? Yep, I did, in a different fabric. 168.101.1. Yes, not zero. Here. Same process, create another, and this is where we create VN 103. VN 103, tenant 1, 101, 0103, 102168, 103.0 slash 24, 102168.103.1, untagged, server that, create, go back to virtual routing zones here, and add DCB loopback. There we go. Update, and I believe we are done. Is that right? Nope, what am I thinking? Ha, we haven't assigned these to interfaces yet. All right, so we've got our routing instance. We've got our virtual network, our subnets. Now we need to tell Astra what ports or aggregates that's going to connect to. And actually, that's two separate workflows. So we're gonna start with the aggregates. And we're going to assign VN101 to AE1 and VN102 to AE2. And then we're going to go update the links, the mapping of the links, so that the physical links match the intent that we're trying to define. So VN101 is assigned to that single homed server, System 3 or BMS3 on our topology, and BMS1 on our topology. So we'll click these boxes to assign VN101 to those interfaces. And then we'll assign AE2 to VN102. And we'll fix the links before we jump over to DCB. And then we'll wrap up. Go to links under staged physical links and click the link edit button cabling map thing. We know that AE1 connects to server one. We know that AE2 connects to server two, and we know that the one that is in single home connects to server three. And I know from my topology that if it's GE007 on either leaf, it connects to one, eight connects to two, nine connects to three, and over here, seven connects to one, eight connects to two. Oh, if I see the number one here, I know that the last number is a seven. 
If I see a two, I know it's an eight. And if I see this not available because it's single homed, I know it's a nine. Update and ready to commit. So I'll go ahead and commit this and move over to DCB to do the same configuration. Connectivity templates, assigning VN101 to AE1, and then assigning VN103 to AE2. We can configure all that stuff too if you want to change your AE net numbers. Um, the whole point of Astra is it's kind of cut down to the amount of custom stuff you need to do. I think, for at least for my part, it's much better to let Astra do what it does and then extract the information after the fact if you really need it. A lot of times we feel this urge to have that information on hand because we need the documentation. One of the beautiful things about running something that's intent is the intent is the documentation. And I think that's also why Terraform is so popular. It's funny because Terraform takes you back to the command line, but I heard one of our folks on a pot a podcast recently with the packet pushers described Terraform as executable documentation. I thought that was really cool because the documentation for Abstra, since it's UI driven, is what I'm doing right now. And with Terraform, if you've got those uh, providers built and there is a Terraform provider for Abstra, the documentation is the email that says, please do this thing and describes the thing. Pretty cool. All right, so we need to go to stage. I'll click that to refresh where we are on the screen. Click links, edit the links. And I know that one if it says AE1, it's going to be a seven out of 77. <laughs> we fixed our, our device profiles to make sure that wasn't gonna be a thing. And if it's two, we've got eight, great update. And commit. Now you'll see, I have an active alarm here. Back here, I'm not gonna make you wait um, for the uh, these errors to clear. If they don't, like I usually do, I'll, um, Re I'll start the recording again. I'll add that on at the end uh, and I'll tell you what happened and how I fixed it. Uh, these will turn green eventually. Uh, thank you for watching. In the next video, we're going to bring up all of our testing hosts and I'm going to make sure I don't forget to unmute my microphone. Thanks for joining me and I'll see you in the next video.